Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the 11th meeting of the Social Security Committee. Can I remind everyone to turn off their mobile phones as it does interfere with the, the recording of, of the meeting? Our first item, agenda item one, is a decision in taking business in private. Are we happy to take item one in private? Yes. Decision in yes. private. Item four, sorry. Thank you. It's actually item four. I'm being corrected by the, by the clerks. Thank you very much, Jenny. Uh, item two in the agenda is a draft budget scrutiny, and that's the main item on the agenda today. Can I welcome Jean Freeman, Minister for Social Security, and the officials who are with her, who is David Signorini, thank you, and Anne McVeigh. I know, Minister, that we will give you ten minutes as an opening statement, if that's all right. Uh, I'll just hand it over to you. Welcome. Thank you very much, and good morning to you, convener, and to members. Um, the committee is aware that budget, the budget document shows uh, an £80 million allocation uh, to be allocated in the course of 2017-18 from the Scottish Government's budget held in the Finance and Constitution portfolio and relating to the Scotland Act 2016 implementation to support our developing social security programme. Allocating this money in year will enable uh, our Cabinet to respond flexibly to the needs of a complicated policy area. Normal in-year budget management arrangements mean that allocations and adjustments can be made in-year in response to pressures, whilst ensuring financial plans are scrutinised and controlled appropriately. The £80 million figure and the arrangements which have been agreed to allocate this funding in 2017-18 reflect the stage the Scottish Government has reached in our Social Security programme, as well as in our overall implementation of the 2016 Scotland Act powers. This programme of work to transfer the new devolved benefits safely and securely, as members know, represents the biggest single challenge any Scottish Government has faced since devolution. We are doing something a Scottish Government has never done before, building a public service, a new public service, uh, our social security system, entirely from scratch. That means that we need skills and expertise that we haven't needed before. To bring the information on the pages of the budget statement alive, I think it might help if we think about the particular groups of people with particular experience and skills that we need to bring together so we can deliver this large and complex programme of work. And as we have consistently said, build our social security system from the ground up. The committee is aware of our plans to recruit over 2,000 volunteers from across Scotland, people with real lived experience of the current benefit system who will work with us over the long term and help us make the right improvements and the right changes to our new system. The process of finding and recruiting these volunteers begins in January. Alongside our experienced panels, we also need some recognised and respected expert knowledge, guidance and leadership from out with the Scottish Government. So we will convene the Disability and Carers Benefits Expert Advisory Group in the new year, and they will work with us, giving us the benefit of their considerable range of expertise to advise and guide us as we go forward. And we will continue our engagement with benefit and welfare advisors with particular practical knowledge of the current system and its interconnections across benefits. Finally, of course, we need civil servants, but civil servants with new skills and expertise that the Scottish Government hasn't previously possessed, or at least not to the extent that we need it now. As we build our new system, our policy teams, operational teams, user researchers, change management teams and developers will work closely together. They will test and build technology to ensure it meets users' needs and our new policies, sharing early versions of technology with the people who will need to use it to allow for constant improvement and development. We will need the right technology in place to ensure that information is shared appropriately and held securely that the overall design and architecture of our system is safe and that the detailed exchange of information about individuals works as intended, which means we need people with the technical expertise to design, build and assure this. Now, they will draw on lessons learned from other major IT projects and on work by Audit Scotland on areas where IT projects in the past have gone wrong. 
to get this right, some of our internal work needs to be structured differently and we will need these new staff with their new skills to manage that effectively. It helps, I think, also to remember that the amount of money to be paid out by our new social security system, 2.7 billion per year, is equivalent to the cost of building two new fourth replacement crossings every year, forever. When everything is up and running, the IT and payment systems that we have to design, develop and build will process a number of payments each week that is roughly equivalent to the total number of payments currently made by the Scottish Government each year. And we mustn't lose sight either of the role that DWP will play in all of this. Because delivering our new social security system, our IT development and our data sharing arrangements won't simply depend on what we do, it will also depend on what the DWP do. We must remember that the Scottish and UK governments are coming at the central question of what is a social security system there to achieve from different perspectives. For the UK government, social security or welfare as they term it is a key driver to get people into work with conditions attached, criteria to be met and budgets to be cut. For us too, there is an important connection between how our social security system supports people to enter into employment, but it is also and importantly there to provide support to any one of us who needs it when we need it. It is a service for people, an investment we make collectively in ourselves and in each other, like our investment in the National Health Service. There against current and future need for each and every one of us. And now that the DWP and the Scottish Government are operating in an increasingly shared space, these different perspectives have to rub along together. And while there is undoubtedly goodwill and a lot of determination to make this work on both sides, there will still be occasions when both governments are looking at the same thing, a problem, an issue or a policy, and seeing a different solution. So this isn't only about tackling issues to do with complex IT systems and data sharing arrangements, where we have governance arrangements in place to support our IT projects and formal processes to provide go, no-go decisions based on our confidence that the technology will work. It's also about tackling issues to do with conflicting policies, priorities or points of view and having the right governance in place for this. The committee is cited on our discussions at the Joint Ministerial Working Group on Welfare, which is the forum where these kind of complex issues can be discussed, differences aired and decisions taken. And there is also the Joint Exchequer Committee to provide oversight on financial matters. So there are arrangements in place to support discussion, negotiation and resolution in order that both sides can come to an agreement and we will, no doubt, need to make use of these at some stage as we go forward. All of this is there to deliver one overriding objective, the safe and secure transfer of vital payments and support benefits. From this committee's work so far and building on the work of the last parliament, I'm sure that members understand why no one outside this committee room is banging on the door, demanding that we move more quickly and why everyone is urging us to go carefully to ensure that no one slips through the cracks. We need a safe and secure approach, which recognises the complexities, the risks and the potential pitfalls. We're not only learning from previous IT programmes, we're also learning from DWP programme failures. Like the rollout of Universal Credit, begun in 2012 with a four-year plan for completion, then extended to 2017, and now delayed again to 2022, 10 years from its start date. Or PIP, which was due to be fully rolled out this year and is now delayed until 2019. So we won't be setting deadlines to suit political pressures. We will set our timetable to meet our objective of the safe and secure transfer of benefits and our consistently stated commitment to deliver the 11 devolved benefits by the end of this parliamentary term. Our budget arrangements for 2017-18 support this approach, and I trust that members will agree that it is the right approach to take. 
My thanks to you, convener, for the opportunity to make that opening statement, and I am, of course, very happy to take questions and to hear members' views. Thank you very much, Minister, and uh, I hear what you say. Uh, I just want to open the discussion up when you mentioned about the differing approaches, and obviously, you know, the Scottish Welfare Fund is something which has been set up, and uh, you know, evidence we have heard from various groups, particularly local authorities, is that um, this is um, becoming greater than was anticipated. People are using it even more, uh, and particularly now even, uh, in regards to larger families uh, due to the UK government's two-child policy. Uh, it looks like families with more than two children uh, may lose up to £2,780 per year. And obviously, groups and local authorities are very concerned that the pressure that's been put, increasing pressure that's been put on the Scottish Welfare Fund. So can, can I ask you, Minister, in regards to uh, that particular uh, issue, if you agree that the pressure on the Scottish Welfare Fund is increasing, and if so, Will the Minister look to increasing the budget in real terms for the Scottish Welfare Fund? And uh, also, are there any plans to basically expand the circumstances which uh, people can claim for crisis grants under uh, the, the fund? Thank you, Convener. Well, of course, as, as you will know, Convener, but perhaps uh, not other uh, newer members of the committee, um, we set up the fund in 2012 with a 9.2 uh, million uh, amount allocated to it um, and have since then subsequently increased it significantly, uh, now at a total level of 38 million. Um, and we have protected that fund in the current uh, budget. Uh, I am aware from uh, our discussions with colleagues who uh, administer that fund in local authorities across Scotland uh, for us under our guidance that there is uh, potentially an emerging um, pressure on the fund in those areas where universal credit is subject uh, to full rollout. Mm. Uh, we're seeing uh, some peak in that. Uh, whether or not that will be a continuing pattern or whether it is at this point a feature of some of the initial uh, difficulties that DWP are encountering in the rollout of universal credit is not entirely clear. And we continue to discuss that matter with them and look with them and with colleagues in uh, local authorities to resolve those initial difficulties. On the two-child policy, I, I hope um, the convener is aware uh, that I have written to Lord Freud expressing our uh, significant disagreement with that approach. Uh, it is an approach, of course, that we will not replicate when we introduce our new benefit, the Best Start Grant, where we will not place a limit on the number of children in a family that we are prepared to support. Uh, over the piece, we will continue to monitor um, the uh, Scottish Welfare Fund and the demand on it. Uh, I have to say, though, and it's perhaps going to be something I'm going to have to keep repeating this morning, uh, it is not possible uh, for this government to mitigate against all of the uh, detrimental impacts of the UK government's approach to welfare and the cuts that they are making. Uh, it's not possible, and arguably uh, it is not the role of this government to plaster over the cuts that the UK government are making. We do our very best with uh, over £100 million of mitigation to try and hold back the very worst effects uh, on families and individuals of those cuts. Uh, but all that is doing is using Scottish Government funds, Scottish uh, citizens' funds, to stand still and not allowing us to use those uh, resources uh, perhaps more effectively to move forward. Thank, thank you very much, Minister, <clears throat> and I appreciate uh, your honesty in being up front in that regard. Uh, obviously mentioned the increase in the Scottish Welfare Fund. It has been suggested that perhaps uh, for more people to be able to know about the Scottish Welfare Fund, perhaps we should have advisors, as you'd mentioned, 2,000 volunteers that's uh, coming on stream uh, to perhaps be in food banks. That certainly was uh, what was suggested to us by the Trussell, well, not to us, but to myself, by the Trussell Trust. Uh, would you be interested in, in looking at something like that, that people <coughs> perhaps don't know about the Scottish Welfare Fund, that people would be there to advise them to be able to access it? 
Yeah, I've had that discussion myself with yeah. the uh, Trussell Trust, uh, and we will begin uh, our benefits take-up campaign uh, early in 2017. Um, it will be a campaign that we will run for the full term of this parliament, though, of course, because there is a great deal of work to do. Uh, we need to work with local authorities in terms of the uh, responsibility they have to undertake income maximisation discussions with individuals that they are working with, perhaps through the welfare fund, uh, in terms of individuals making contact with them or in other means. And there are a number of very interesting initiatives across the country about uh, how you can provide effective welfare advice and support to individuals where they are. So, for example, there are a number of projects running across the country locating welfare advisors and that kind of support uh, in our healthcare service, in primary care. Uh, the Trussell mm -hmm. Fund's uh, point as well about uh, the use of food banks uh, and we're looking at all of that as we go forward, uh, not only in terms of our strategy on uh, food, uh, food poverty and sustainable food, but also in how we look at the delivery of the social security service and the advice services and support services that need to go alongside that. Thank you. Ruth McGuire, did you want to come in on that particular aspect? Thank you, Convener. Just, just quickly um, on um, the topic of take-up. Obviously, some of the... Um, entitlements that are coming to us and the kind of sure start and the funeral payment have got really quite a low take up at the moment. I know we spoke about that in, in the, the chamber debate um, on funeral poverty. I'd just like to hear your reflections on what can be done about that and, and is there an impact on the budget that the Scottish Government will receive to then have responsibility for these payments? Um, well, well, of course, the, the primary point of running the benefits campaign, and all members have, have made the point uh, to us that uh, they support us doing that as a government and meeting that commitment in our manifesto, is actually to secure for individuals uh, the maximum financial support that they are entitled to. And you are, of course, right that uh, some of the benefits that will be devolved to us, in particular, the take-up rate is very low. Young carers... Uh, the, is, a, is another area uh, in terms of uh, 16 to uh, 24 year olds uh, as well as funeral payment and others. Um, I have uh, been promised by um, my officials a significant degree of recess reading, uh, one part of which is actually the proposition on the benefits campaign uh, and the advice on how we will uh, overall approach that and specifically where we will start and what we will start to do. Uh, so I'll, I'll be reading that over the Christmas break uh, and we will come back with some decisions made on that and of course make sure the, the committee uh, is aware of those uh, and the, the parliament more widely. I think the, the other key thing to say though in that is that this is not going to be one of those bells and whistles adverts everywhere benefits take-up campaigns, uh, because for me, um, my previous experience before uh, my current role is that such campaigns do not land very effectively. You have to target people where they are uh, on the basis on which they, they come towards a public service, whichever public service that might be, and try at that point to engage them in thinking about what additional financial support they may be entitled to, and the key word is entitlement, because that helps people uh, overcome their reluctance, oftentimes, particularly in areas of funeral payments, I think, and, and also young carers and elsewhere, their reluctance to, look, to appear to be looking for something that they somehow feel, and this is, of course, a wider discussion we could have, they somehow feel uh, they're not due or it will be considered that they're trying to uh, sponge in some way. So we need to overcome that in the overall campaign and look at how we phase it in order and land it in order to uh, get to the right folks at the right time. Um, so we, we'll be, I will be looking at that over um, this Christmas recess and early in the new year we'll be making some decisions and communicating to uh, this committee and other members about how we intend to take that campaign forward. Oh, thank you. 
Well, Mark Griffiths. It was Adam de Gaulle, do you think? Wasn't it? No, it was Mark. Oh, sorry, I think it was Mark. <laughs> Thank, thanks, Camilla. Morning, Minister. Um, I understand the government's thinking around the £80 million um, reserve for in-year spending. Can I ask if, you have, um, if you're able to give the committee any early indication as to whether any of that um, £80 million fund will be used to meet any of the commitments the government has made on any of the devolved powers? Um, and I'm thinking around um, increasing carrier's allowance or uprating of benefits. Uh, well, one of, one of the areas that we will make uh, some initial spend, of course, is in the benefits take-up campaign. But in terms of uh, our, using our top-up powers for carers' allowance or uh, introducing uh, our new benefit, which is the Best Start grant, we are a little too early in the day at this point in December for me to be able to say, yes, we will be doing that next year or no we won't the most important thing we have to do next year of course uh, well one of the many important things we have to do next year is bring legislation uh, to the parliament draft legislation which will give us the legislative platform on which to exercise those uh, powers now in advance of that there will be a commencement order uh, at Westminster which then allows us to bring the legislation to the Parliament. That legislation will bring to, of course, as it does, a financial memorandum where some more detail uh, on the uh, financial requirements uh, that we have will be set out. But all of that will come together uh, in the, the next year and certainly before uh, we enter the summer recess. Okay, thanks for that. Yeah, you mentioned that Social Security Bill and that is also mentioned in the, the budget. Um, describe the setting out the framework for a fairer system and there's a, a number of um, issues there and one of them is this reform of assessments for disability benefits and we've had exchanges in the chamber about this as well. I wonder if the government have come to a conclusion on assessments as to what involvement there would be or hopefully wouldn't be from the private sector. Well, overall on uh what the need might be for assessment at all and for how many and this is of course um, in, particularly in relation to disability benefits just so that we're clear the ones that will be devolved to us um, one other part of my uh, Christmas reading is the independent analysis of the, cons the over 500 consultation responses uh, and uh, the draft response from us as a government to that independent uh, analysis. And again, uh, we will publish that and advise uh, the Parliament of both in, uh, at the start of the, of the next session, at the beginning of the year. Uh, so, to a degree, <clears throat> our thinking on the overall assessment process, the need for it, the demand that we might have in terms of numbers, and what it should look like uh, ought to be quite rightly informed by that consultation exercise and will itself then be further tested through the experience panels uh, that uh, I mentioned uh, in my opening statement. But with um, particular reference to your specific question uh, around the involvement of uh, private sector in any assessment exercise or process, of course, uh, the private sector currently have a DWP contract uh, to deliver uh, that work in Scotland. That contract uh, is due to end, I think, but my colleagues will correct me if I'm wrong in this, in 2018 or 19? 2018? 2019. 2019. Uh, I have written to the DWP asking them not to exercise the one-year extension to that contract, uh, which is it built into the contract that you can uh, extend it uh, for a year without having to recontract. So I've, I've written to them asking them not to do that uh, because those kind of decisions should sit with the Scottish Government. Uh, and I think uh, I am on record elsewhere as saying that um, I remain to be convinced that a social security system that is founded on the principles of dignity, fairness and respect and I have every intention will make those values come alive in everything it does, how that system can be served 
by any other organisation whose principal proposition is to make commercial profit. I'm not criticising those private sector organisations for that, that's the nature of who they are and their business, but I am not myself convinced that those two approaches uh, comfortably align with each other. Okay. Thank you. Ben McPherson, did you want to come in on that particular one? Then I think Gordon yeah. wanted to come in on that particular. Th thank you, convener. Issue. It's in relation to, to the new powers, but um, it, just for, for point of reference, a few months ago I celebrated the 25th anniversary of the Rock Trust, a fantastic youth homelessness organisation uh, based in Edinburgh, and we, we celebrated that here. And that, that organisation was set up 25 years ago to alleviate youth homelessness because of reductions in uh, housing benefit support for, for young people. So I, I was particularly interested to know whether the Scottish Government still intend to restore entitlement to housing benefit support for 18 to 21 year olds, and uh, how many people you estimate will be implicated uh, impacted by the, the unhelpful UK government policy to to remove that uh, entitlement to that group of, group of people, and whether uh, how the restoration of housing benefit for for that group will be used, uh, how that will impact the budget for 2017-18, and, and what powers will be used to achieve the restoration of that. Um, well, that that is our manifesto commitment, and um, we. I have no intention of stepping back from that commitment. Um, we, we do ha currently have an ongoing discussion uh, with ministerial colleagues at Westminster uh, on the approach that they're taking on that and uh, how that impacts or not on our uh, ability to meet our manifesto commitment easily. Uh, they have, as you know, uh, announced a number of exemptions to their intended policy, which of course is very welcome. Uh, but they are approaching uh, how they intend to implement uh, their policy using a particular set of regulations, uh, and we have a disagreement with them on that. We think there is an alternative set of regulations that could be used, which would make, uh, which would allow them to do what, what they want to do, as they're perfectly entitled to, as a as the UK government, but would also allow us uh, to fulfil our manifesto commitment as we're perfectly entitled to do as the Scottish government. And so that uh, discussion continues. Uh, and uh, I have uh, written to Carolyn Noakes, the minister uh, concerned, uh, on two occasions. Uh, we had a meeting on the 9th of December, 12th, 12th of December, uh, and had that discussion amongst other areas. We've uh, exchanged a Second set of letters, uh, I know that uh, the Cabinet Secretary has uh, had an initial discussion with Mr Mundell uh, on this matter too, and we will continue to have those discussions to see if we can resolve um, the, the issues around how we implement our manifesto commitment. Uh, the question isn't whether we will, it's really about how can we go about doing this. In terms of the numbers involved, we need to um, do a little bit more work now or to um, calculate what it means in terms of the UK government's exemption list, what that does to the numbers in Scotland, uh, and w that work is currently going on. Okay, thank you. Gordon Lintel, she wanted to come in on that particular subject, and then Adam Tompkins. Well, uh, thank you, convener. Um, good morning, Minister. Good morning. When we're, we're talking about um, timelines and that in relation to the new powers coming into force, I was just wanting to ask about the, the Fair Scotland Action Plan commits to a financial health check service with an older people strand, so something that may be of particular relevance to older people in Edinburgh and Lothian, the area that I represent. What I'm interested in is can you give a date as to when that will be brought into action because there's no as I understand it, details of when this is planned to be implemented? Well, of course, the financial health check for older people is very relevant to uh, older people across Scotland uh, uh, in all our, our respective constituencies. Uh, there is a responsibility on local authorities to undertake um, financial uh, health checks and support for those that come into contact with them, as I said earlier, and we'll be discussing with local authorities how they can uh, increase uh, the, uh, 
the work that they do in that area. Um, with respect to the overall financial health check, it, it links into our benefit take-up campaign uh, as well, and that will be part and parcel of what uh, we will be uh, advising yourselves and Parliament of in the new year. Uh, we're also looking, because another area of my responsibilities is for older people, uh, and I've had some initial discussions with, uh, uh, with SOPA and with the Scottish Pensioners Forum and with others about a range of uh, work that we might do now in a more coherent way uh, to support older people uh, across Scotland, and, and part of that is around the financial support uh, that they receive. Um, there is an emerging issue, of course, coming from those groups with respect to uh, women and the uh, pension changes uh, that are affecting women, um, actually myself included, uh, of, of a particular age range and uh, years of birth. Uh, so there are a number of issues to look at with respect to the overall financial situation and, uh, of older people across Scotland and the support that this government can offer to them and also can uh, work with others to provide. Thank you. Um, it is, of course, a matter relevant to older people across Scotland, as, as you rightly point out. Um, you mentioned local councils, and just in light of the fact that the budget line has been reduced in this area from 8 million to, or is intended to reduce from 8 million to 6.9 million in 27 to 18, against the background of an increased budget for the Scottish Government. Um, do you view that as being an area that it is more the responsibility of local councils to deliver on this rather than the Scottish Government? Well, well of course, Mr Lintars, you and I are going to disagree on those figures, are we not? Uh, quite significantly. Uh, but in answer to your particular question, no, I don't think it is an area uh, of greater responsibility for local authorities than it is for Scottish Government. I think it is actually an area of responsibility of uh, UK Government, Scottish Government and local authorities. And uh, part of our difficulty, and indeed the difficulty uh, our colleagues in local authorities face, is at times mitigating the impact of UK Government decisions. Uh, and the particular instance I referred to there with respect to that uh, fairly large group of women uh, affected by uh, pension changes, uh, of course, is a case in point. So it is a responsibility of uh, all tiers of government to work to ensure that individuals receive uh, the maximum entitlement uh, that they have to financial support. George Adam, you wanted to win that particular yeah, point. Yeah, it was just yeah. to come on the back of what Mr Lintos had already said. Was You've already said this yourself, uh, Minister, that you know uh, the actual safe transfer of the powers is probably the biggest challenge since the evolution itself. And is it not the case that you know the challenge is such? I want to talk in very practical terms. Very day one when we have to actually get to the stage where people are expecting their money in their bank accounts for all the various benefits. And I think that's what we must keep in mind when we're we're discussing this. You know that's the end game with the whole scenario. And there isn't a big red button that we press and magically everything works out. And is it not the case that you've got numerous uh, data for claimants in numerous DWP computers? You know, you mentioned about the IT, and we have to make sure that we get that 100% right. We need to learn from mistakes that have been made in government in the past with these things. And there's also the fact that some of it is manually uh, kind of based as well. You know, if I was you, I'd be physically wanting to be in that room to make sure that I got all that information in case somebody's uh, the details fell off the top of a file somewhere. So it's, it's a huge responsibility to try and make sure that we get all this detail. It would probably have been easier to get 100% of the, uh, the powers as opposed to just the 15. But picking at it this way, it's making it extremely difficult for us to make sure we get this right. Because the most important part is that come that day that the money lands in the claimant's bank account. Uh, absolutely, absolutely, absolutely the case. Um, that, that is our overriding primary objective, that by the end of this Parliament, we are delivering 11 devolved benefits um, at the right amount to the right people on the right day. Uh, and yes, Mr Adams is absolutely correct in terms of the complexity of doing that before uh, setting aside 
any improvements, changes or alterations we might want to make to the system or to the individual benefits themselves. I think I have raised with the committee before, but it bears repetition that, for example, cold weather payments rest on 11 different IT systems inside DWP, all of which have to work together simply to give us the basic data of the individuals in Scotland who are entitled currently to that payment. Industrial injuries and severe disablement benefit is a paper-based system. So there are a significant number of uh, brown folders somewhere uh, uh, inside DWP, 20 odd thousand plus of which uh, will carry a Scottish postcode and those files have to be extracted the postcodes have to be found, the files extracted, again, simply for us to know who in Scotland uh, currently is entitled to that benefit so that we can then input into our system their names, addresses, bank details and the level of support that they are currently entitled to receive. That, that task, those tasks on their own uh, are labour intensive and uh, require uh, checking and constant rechecking and so on because what we can't have is uh, individuals uh, at the point where we are delivering those benefits who don't receive what they're entitled to because the data we don't have the data. Uh, now DWP are uh, very keen to make sure that they get that right. We are very keen they, are yeah. sure to, they get that right too, but it is quite a labour intensive task. Yeah. I just, uh, Mr. Tompkins, Adam Tompkins, connects. I just wondered how that affects the budget in regards to the question that was asked. If that would add extra cost to the budget, or would that come from the DWP? Uh, no, th those uh, elements of the cost are uh, factored into our thinking, both at the DWP end and at our end, uh, about uh, exactly how much work and by whom. Uh, needs to be done. Although, I think I've said before, um, but again, I think it bears repetition. You know, you need to go right back to the Smith Commission, where the Smith Commission's uh, reference to all of this that takes us to where we are now is, was but a few paragraphs. Uh, after that came the fiscal framework, a bit more detail around those few paragraphs and the enduring uh, settlement, a bit more. But the work that the DWP and uh, my colleagues in Scottish Government have been doing over the piece since then and continue to do, of course, uh, as you might expect, begins to uh, reveal additional uh, complexities and areas of activity that are required that could never have been foreseen at the point of the Smith Commission. So it is an area that both DWP and ourselves keep under review, but uh, as best as we know it at this point, uh, we have been able to take account of, of those matters in our thinking. But that doesn't mean that other issues might not arise uh, that will produce additional pressures, uh, which we will have to then uh, look at with uh, Cabinet colleagues and Mr Mackay, obviously, in particular. I don't know if that will happen or not, but I think it's perfectly sensible to say that we should be alert to the fact that it might. Okay. Adam Tompkins. Um, a, a few short paragraphs of the Smith Commission Agreement, perhaps, but a few short paragraphs that were very difficult to write. Um, uh, can I take you back to the numbers and ask you two, I hope, I hope reasonably quick questions about uh, different aspects of the numbers and then a question about prioritisation? So, uh, first quick question about the, the, the numbers. You mentioned in your opening remarks, Minister, um, the £80 million that sits in the Finance and Constitution budget for Scotland Act 2016 non-tax implementation. How much of that do you anticipate to be spent in connection with Social Security? Is, that, is, that, is, is it 100% of that £80 million that will be in Social Security, or is it some uh, lesser number than that? That's the first question about the numbers. The second is, um, just to make sure that I've understood correctly, um, the massive difference between the 2016-17 draft budget number for um, Social Security and the actual budget number, the former being 74.3 million, the latter being 1.4 million. And just to make sure that I've understood correctly, that, that, that doesn't mean that the, that the money wasn't spent. It means that 
by the time of the actual budget, the money had already been transferred to local authorities to spend. Can I, and then I'll come back on the prioritisation question in a minute, if I may. Okay. Okay. Um, the answer to your first question is that 80 million is for all the powers, um, so not exclusively for social sure. security, um, and that is why I made reference to um, the cabinet's uh, ability uh, as we go through the year to respond to uh, pressures and requirements as we uh, identify them and yeah. allocate from within that 80 million. Yeah, but the question was how much of that money do you anticipate being spent on social security and how much on other aspects of Scotland Act um, 2016 implementation? It's not possible for me to give you a specific figure at this point. Right. Um, I, I believe I am back before committee at some point in February or um, uh, early March. Um, and at that, at that stage, we may have more information. But the, the reason for uh, the fact that I can't uh, say exactly how much of that 80 million we might require um, is because we are still working through, obviously, the consultation responses and the specific elements of the timescale that we, the timetable that we have to meet mm -hmm. um, to allow us to understand uh, the numbers of additional uh, resources that we might need in terms of those groups of people that I talked about, as well as other matters that the um, convener herself referred to in the joint work with DWP. So how did you arrive at the £80 million figure? Uh, because uh, colleagues uh, looked overall, uh, not just in Social Security, but in terms of uh, the other portfolios that, that relate to this in, in the additional powers, uh, at what the most uh, reasonable estimate would be uh, of what we would require over the course of a year. Mm -hmm. And that is where the figure comes from. Thank you. And then, and then the second figure, the, the, the move from 74.3 million to 1.4 yeah. million. Yeah, your understanding is correct. Thank you very much. And so the question about prioritisation, um, uh, on page 86 of the um, budget document, um, uh, there is uh, what is, to my mind, the very welcome news that the Scottish Government plans to invest <coughs> more than £75 million in regeneration activity that stimulates inclusive economic growth, tackles inequality, disadvantaged communities, etc., to about two-thirds of the way down uh, that page. Um, now, um, uh, you know, Minister, I hope that I'm very interested in the relationship between social security spending and other aspects of spending that are essential to uh, an effective uh, anti-poverty uh, strategy. Um, and I just wondered if you could tell the committee anything about uh, the, the Scottish Government's thinking and your thinking about the relationship between that sort of spending that's um, talked about on page 86, which you might call preventive spending, Chris the Christie Commission and the idea of preventive spending is introduced on the following page, but the relationship between that kind of spending and the kind of spending that you need in the social security system I itself. How, how do you assess the appropriate balance between um, uh, um, the, the sort of 75 million of investment and regeneration that we see on the one hand with the uh, social security entitlement expenditure that you've been talking about so far this morning? Well, I haven't been talking about so social security entitlement expenditure, if by that you think I'm, that's what I mean when I talk about the 80 million. No, no, no. indeed. So you're talking about um, the overall yeah. delivery of the 11 devolved benefits and uh, the connection between that and... I just wonder if there's any, if there's any way in which you can help us understand your thinking mm -hmm. about the relationship between um, uh, um, spending on um, what I would call the underlying causes of poverty, which include you know, the absence of regeneration, uh, include deprived communities and all of that. Um, the relationship between spending on that and spending on social security itself. Okay, well, I think there is a really strong connection between the two, because if we provide individuals with adequate financial support uh, through uh, a social security system, then, of course, they are using that support to spend in their local communities. Uh, they are also using that support if we look at individuals who uh, are entitled to the disability benefits there to support the additional costs uh, that they incur because of their ill health or their disability. Uh, in many instances, that support can mean the difference for them between taking up uh, opportunities for employment or not. Uh, and again, that has a, a key connection with local community regeneration as well as the positive impacts it can make in their own lives. Now, we will not be able to uh, make 
the kind of impact in that particular area uh, that we might wish to, because employment support allowance uh, will not be uh, in our hands. Uh, but we will be able, I think, to uh, provide significant uh, support to those individuals in terms of the disability benefits that we will be responsible for that alleviate at least some of the financial pressure that they might otherwise face. So, the, the, you, as you know and I know, uh, Mr Tompkins, you know, our uh, relatively privileged position that we have in terms of the financial resources that we individually have at our disposal allow us to uh, look at opportunities to plan ahead uh, and indeed uh, to spend money. Uh, financial support through a social security system gives individuals the minimum opportunity to do something similar, but it does also uh, help them to look at employment opportunities if they exist, and that is something that they're able to do, uh, not only in terms of their uh, physical and other capacities, but in terms of their other responsibilities. So carers allowance, for example, uh, Currently, of course, we want to increase it to the same level of job seekers allowance, and we will do that. But I also want to look at some of the current restrictions within carers allowance that uh, reduce uh, the amount of time that individuals uh, can use uh, in their daily life to pursue further or higher education, to look at part-time employment, because it seems to me uh, only right that individuals should be able to pursue a life of their own as well as meeting uh, the caring responsibilities they've taken on for which we are all in greatly in their debt. So I think there is work that we can do uh, in uh, the social security system uh, to assist individuals to uh, have some measure of financial stability. It will never be more than the minimum uh, but some measure of financial stability and security which allows them then to look at what other opportunities might be available to them. And of course, the work of my colleague, Mr Hepburn, in the devolved employment programmes, as well as the overall work in here uh, that you refer to, it is all part of trying to maximise economic growth and equality of opportunity across the country. Thank you very much. Pauline Meekney. Uh, good morning, Minister. Um, I have some questions about um, your priorities in relation to child poverty. Um, so I think the committee can obviously see um, the many pressures on the budget. Um, but since we're going to be dealing with the child poverty bill in the not too distant future, I thought it'd be quite important to try and get your um, current thinking on the record. So if I could begin with asking you what estimates have been made um, by the government on the impact of the draft budget on child poverty levels, if any? Well, the, the, um, there is, of course, as you know, an equality uh, uh, statement that goes alongside uh, the draft budget, uh, and that statement highlights a number of the positive measures in the budget that uh, will impact on uh, child poverty, uh, including the commitment to increase uh, childcare, um, the uh, commitment in, that relates directly to my responsibility in Social Security uh, to introduce the new uh, Best Start grant uh, and uh, the work on uh, educational maintenance allowances. So that e equality impact statement, if you like, uh, begins to point to uh, some of the areas where the budget itself uh, should have a positive effect uh, on child poverty. But the overall um, approach is to recognise that whatever uh, this government or previous governments have done to try to tackle child poverty, whilst they have been effective to a degree, have not been sufficiently effective. And that is why the consultation that my colleague Ms Constance has just completed uh, on child poverty and the bill that she will introduce uh, shortly, which will come separately from her to this committee, uh, looks to spe uh, specific our, uh, actions uh, and resources that will target the most difficult areas in terms of child poverty to try and secure a kind of major shift uh, and reduction in the numbers there. Um, just to follow up from that, I mean, you mentioned a couple of areas that I presume are some of your spending priorities, but I just wanted to be clear um, what you were saying in relation to the budget as what 
you regard as the most important areas for, for spending priorities in relation to reducing child poverty? Well, that area is you know, more for Ms Constance than it is uh, obviously right. for myself. It is the area that she is leading on. But clearly, mm -hmm. um, in terms of the budget and the resources uh, that the budget uh, allocates, the two uh, main areas are the increase in the provision of childcare and uh, the uh, commitment on the uh, attainment gap. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, just lastly, um, given the number of portfolios that probably feed into the uh, reducing child poverty, just for the record, could you just tell us what other ministers that you, you currently work with across portfolios on the child poverty issue? Um, well, it is an important point, and actually there is uh, an element in the uh, bill that will come forward, which is uh, placing a, a statutory duty uh, on Scottish ministers in terms of the draft bill uh, of the work that they are doing uh, to reduce child poverty and to report on that. The, the uh, main other portfolios that would be uh, involved here are, of course, education uh, and health, uh, but also uh, areas in, under Mr Brown's remit uh, in terms of economy and fair work. Thank you very much. <coughs> Alison Johnson. Yes, perhaps um, following on from, from Pauline McNeill's questions, Minister, uh, can I ask what thought in the process of putting the budget together was given to topping up child benefit? Because uh, um, was it your, your previous um, appearance before us at the end of September, you did say that you were giving consideration to the Child Poverty Action Group's proposal to increase child benefit by £5 a week. So it would be useful to know what sort of consideration was given to that and what the outcome is, was. Um, it, it is a matter still under consideration. Of course, it sits uh, overall in the consultation on child poverty and uh, the results of that consultation and uh, will, I'm sure, form part of this committee scrutiny on the child poverty bill that is brought forward, which will be introducing uh, specific targets as well as that duty that I mentioned. Um, there are a number of uh, perfectly legitimate and uh, entirely understandable uh, demands uh, being placed before us uh, for additional resources across a range of benefits. Child poverty is, is one such area. Um, the the top-up and child benefit is around 250 million would be uh, the additional cost. Uh, there are others uh, with respect to um, uh, mitigating uh, the impact of UK government changes on employment support allowance, another 65 million or so. Obviously, uh, uh, people are concerned about the benefit cap and the significant increase in the numbers of people in Scotland who will be affected uh, by that cap introduced uh, in early November. Uh, again, it's a very difficult uh, number to, a figure to estimate. The conservative estimates are between about six and 11 million uh, for mitigation in that area. So I think you can begin to see before we even look at uh, impacting the, uh, in the effects on universal credit, or uh, local housing allowance application to the social sector, that there, are, there is a totting up uh, of significant proportions here uh, uh, in terms of what people, as I say, understandably and perfectly legitimately uh, want us to consider doing. We need to uh, consider all of those in a reflective and sensible way against a situation where, over the piece, the Scottish budget has been reduced by about 9.2%. And there are clearly uh, competing demands and pressures on that budget. We are uh, in a situation with this portfolio where we've managed to protect uh, very many of the spending lines, the, the critical spending lines within it. Um, we will look at the proposition on child benefit in the round when we're looking at the strategy and the bill that comes forward. Um, I have to say there is an argument that uh, applying a top-up on child benefit uh, to all those who are currently in receipt of child benefit um, is not necessarily uh, the best use of that level of resource to specifically target the issue of child poverty that um, we're talking about 
uh, and within the overall uh, frame of the approach that Ms Constance is taking, which is to look at where do we need to target activity and resource in order to secure a significant shift in the levels of child poverty in Scotland. So all of those uh, discussions and reflections um, continue, uh, and I'm sure the committee will return to that with the Cabinet Secretary. Okay, um, thank you for that comprehensive response. If I might touch on another area, convener, and um, we've uh, had a fair amount of discussion this morning about the need to mitigate some of the worst impacts of decisions made in another parliament. Um, and the discretionary housing payment budget is 57.9 million, and 47 million of that has been earmarked for, for bedroom tax mitigation. And you, you might be aware that the Scottish Federation of Housing Associations raised concerns when they were giving evidence to the committee that the proposed discretionary housing payment budget won't be sufficient to counteract UK welfare reforms in the next year. Just wondered if you had any comment to make on that area. Um, it, it, it is entirely the case that the um, association are correct. You know, to, to counter the effect of in full of all UK welfare reforms uh, on people in Scotland, um, not only takes us through that list that I just briefly ran through of the 65 million between 6 and 11 million, 256 million plus plus, uh, but significantly more. And uh, there are two arguments there. First of all, this uh, government's capacity in a situation, as I've said, um, where our own overall budget uh, has over the years been significantly increased, decreased uh, by that 9.2%. Uh, the balance of decisions that the government has to make between mitigating the worst effects and impacts of decisions made by another government uh, from the uh, perfectly correct approach uh, and demands which are about investing in order to secure economic growth, protecting our health service, uh, supporting our schools and our justice system and our local authorities and uh, their services, uh, is a very difficult balance to strike. And one where in the current circumstances, it is not possible for this government to mitigate all the impacts of decisions made by UK government. Um, there is an additional argument to that, which I touched on, uh, which is about um, whether it is the best use of uh, Scottish government funds, uh, funds from citizens in Scotland, to constantly put sticking plasters uh, on uh, the cuts imposed by decisions made by another government. That is a separate and but very connected argument, but the bottom line is um, it is not possible to do all of those things. If, I uh, just find a question, Camino, if I may, if that 47 million is, is not sufficient, will local authorities be expected to draw on the remaining 10.7 million of that discretionary housing payment budget? Yeah. <clears throat> well, of course, we, we uh, arrive at those figures from uh, our understanding of uh, previous use and our discussions with local authorities. And if it looks like uh, there would be a greater uh, demand in terms of uh, mitigating the full effects of the bedroom tax, a very clear commitment we've uh, been delivering on for some time now, then uh, two things happen. We obviously are in continuing discussions with local authorities on that. We have a look at the data and then we consider what we might do. We have in the past, uh, where that has been the case, uh, provided additional resources in order uh, not to require local authorities to draw on that other element of the fund, uh, because that simply is uh, a difficult uh, thing to do. But in this instance, should that happen uh, at this, in this uh, coming financial year, or in the financial year to which the budget relates, then we would go through the same exercise. And at this point, it's not possible for me to say we definitely would or we definitely wouldn't, simply to point you to the fact that we have in the past. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Ruth McGuire. Convener, Minister, you mentioned in your opening statement the significant delays to um, full rollout of universal credit, mm. and there's also delays with um, the personal independence payment and 
for sake of balance, probably say that the Scottish Government has some experience of delayed payments as well. <laughs> um, how, I mean, it's, it's obviously, you know, it's a hugely complex undertaking. So how can you learn from the mistakes of both um, the Scottish Government in terms of CAP and that of the UK Government, um, the, you know, the delays that they've seen with Universal Credit and, and PIP? Uh, thank you uh, for that. Um, well, the, on, on the, the uh, payment delays and uh, the, the arise from uh, IT systems uh, and uh, IT system failures, uh, there is a, a very active exercise uh, going on inside uh, Scottish Government that looks at uh, the lessons that have been learned which are very detailed and uh, not only Audit Scotland but internal uh, reviews of those and looks at applying them to uh, the system design and delivery that we will have for Social Security. And that work has begun uh, only this week. Um, I uh, was taken through some of the initial um, uh, look at what, what kind of a payment system do we need, what does it need to do, um, how has it been tested so far, what more now, what now is the next stage. Uh, and a number of steps have been introduced across Scottish Government uh, around the process for the design, build and test of IT systems that draw on uh, those uh, lessons to be learned uh, inside, uh, Scot from Scottish Government, previous programmes and others, uh, for example, in other agencies and elsewhere. Um, so my job, um, so I have a, a fortunate in that I have a group of clever people, um, but with a very practical approach who are beginning that work uh, really very early, actually, and running that testing and designing. Of course, the experience panels will have a role to play uh, in due course in all of that, to look at um, what we are um, producing in terms of how easy is it uh, for a potential user to access uh, and provide the data that is being looked for and the, the, the more than one platforms in which we should be able uh, to offer uh, the user uh, uh, interaction with the with the agency and with the system. So on the on the IT uh, payment system, um, I think those lessons are very uh, very well uh, embedded in the thinking and the design and the planning and the the testing and retesting will be constant for uh, the next significant period. On the other questions around um, delays in program delivery. Uh, which weren't uh, exclusively around uh, IT systems. Uh, there is a very interesting uh, document uh, produced by uh, uh, the Institute of, for Governance uh, around universal credit, uh, which I would recommend any politician should read, because it takes, through, uh, takes you through an analysis of um, the, some of the core difficulties that have been experienced in the rollout of universal credit. And one of the um, jump out lessons, if you like, for me, is about uh, setting unrealistic timescales in order to get yourself through a difficult uh, circumstance in a parliamentary chamber, uh, that then um, are timescales which, in practical terms and in terms of assurance and testing, cannot be delivered. Uh, and so uh, individuals are forced to try and rush things in order to meet that uh, politician set time frame and uh, matters don't proceed very well. There are other important lessons in uh, how you marry policy to delivery uh, and uh, in a very practical sense it will in our instance affect 1.4 million people. Um, so I'd recommend it to anyone uh, to read it. It's not quite, I wouldn't call it a page turner, and it doesn't have a happy ending, um, but it is very, very instructive and very useful. Um, and so that is what I meant when I said, you know, learning from uh, those who have gone before, if you like, to try and make sure that we get our system right. And I do think that the involvement of those 2,000 volunteers in that experience panel uh, will be of uh, significant 
positive impact to the work that we're doing. Thanks, Kevin. I, I don't really have a follow-up. I just, I, I suppose it's those 1.4 million folk that are, are in my mind. So it's good to hear that we have um, learned lessons and, um, as you say, we'll, we'll um, be cognizant of the complexity of it and, and not set unrealistic targets. Uh, could, could I perhaps, Pauline, did you want to come in first? <clears throat> could I perhaps ask possibly a very simple question, but it might not be a, a simple answer. You mentioned in the comments there about unrealistic timescales, and obviously because of the budget and the constraints uh, with the autumn uh, you know, statement, we haven't had a great deal of time to actually look over uh, budget figures. I think that goes for all committees, not just our committee. So my very simple question, which may not be a very simple answer. As the areas we've discussed today in regards to the budget that has been set for Social Security Committee, even though it's working along with other committees, obviously, education, etc., etc., would you say that um, there'll be changes to that budget, or will the budget be sufficient to deliver uh, what, what we're looking to deliver, and that is a Social Security system based on dignity and respect? per se, that it comes in 2017, 2018, or even 2019. Uh, are you referring to the 80 million? Yes. Right. And uh, uh, our call on that 80 million. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, I am confident that, uh, that we have got that, that uh, overall uh, expectation right. I, th I think it's just worth um, reminding ourselves that, of course, this is a staged process that we're going through. Uh, and in future years, uh, there may be uh, greater demand that we will place on uh, the implementation element uh, of the budget as we go through all the various steps. Uh, but at this point, bearing in mind that next year our uh, role will be to uh, draft and deliver a, a draft bill to this parliament with a financial memorandum, uh, and then obviously in the course of about 12 months to go through all its key stages, to make decisions uh, from the stage two option appraisal on the shape and nature of the Social Security Agency, um, and to begin to um, set up the experience panels, the expert advisory group, and continue uh, the work on the basis of the analysis of the consultation responses on uh, how we will deliver um, a social security system in Scotland and what improvements it's there possible for us to make in the time frame of this parliamentary term uh, and which ones we want to signal we believe should be made thereafter, then I think if we hold that timetable, if you like, in our head or the steps we have to go through it clearly in our head, then I think uh, it is fair. Uh, for me to say that at this stage, yes, I am comfortable. Thank you. Polly McNeill, then, Mark Prince. Yep, it's an observation about this process, but I would like your, your comments on it. Um, budget processes are always difficult, especially when they're done at this speed, but um, we are where we are. But what I'm trying to sort of work out, because we've got to have a discussion after this and we've got to comment on this. So... As you've said, there's a number of areas that the government needs to look at which are mitigating things done in another parliament, but there's a very long list, which I'm sure you're aware of. Um, the discretionary housing payments, the 18 to 21s, the bedroom tax, uh, possibilities on the pension issue, council tax reduction, creation of new benefits, and so on. Um, what concerns me as an individual member trying to scrutinise, I can't really see what this budget is really going to look like. I can't see at the moment where the space is for us to see, well, actually, we think, as we're entitled to do, you, that priority is wrong and that we should, you, this priority is the right one. I think at the moment, I, I don't think that the committee are in a position to say that because everything's under consideration. Now, I, I totally understand why that's the case. I just wondered if you could give us maybe some indication about what your thoughts are when that would begin to materialise, or is it so tied up with the creation of the new system that we're not going to see it? Um, and of course, I'm sure that just for the, the, for the purposes of, of people who are reading the report, it's also important, I think, for members of the general public to have a general and clear understanding of where, of where we're going in the budget. 
okay, um, I, I completely understand why you're asking that. Um, and uh, in your shoes, I would probably ask the same question. Now, some of what you, you mentioned is, of course, already clearly in the budget. So the mitigation of the bedroom tax is not a new commitment. It is a continuing commitment. And uh, the amount uh, that we believe is required to do that is there in the budget, the draft budget. And um, uh, Ms Johnson and I have already had an exchange about uh, the rest of, of uh, the budget in which that sits and what may be required of it. Um, we have a number of uh, commitments uh, as a government from our manifesto that we will deliver. Uh, that includes uh, support for 18 to one, uh, 20, or the reinstatement uh, of housing support for 18 to 21 year olds, the introduction of the new benefit uh, being the Best Start grant, using our top up powers in terms of carers allowance, extending fuel, uh, uh, payments to uh, families with severely disabled children, uh, and so on. Uh, all those, so, that, so let's take the bedroom tax and, and put it to one side because it sits uh, already in the budget, it's a continuing commitment and the amount is there. The other areas uh, that you've touched on, uh, some of which I've just gone through, are our manifesto commitments that we will deliver on and others which are pressures that are coming uh, from other organisations and uh, other parties, perfectly legitimately, uh, requiring us or asking us to consider uh, using resources to mitigate uh, the impact of decisions made uh, in the UK government uh, with respect to uh, child poverty or uh, other benefit changes and so on. Um, we have to consider as we go forward. Um, what I have said before to this committee is that um, whilst I am crystal clear that I will not rush the setup and delivery of the agency and those benefits, and we've had discussions in the chamber and elsewhere around the split between a legislative and executive competence and the very sound rationale for that. Uh, I have also said that um, we are currently considering uh, which of the manifesto commitments we currently have, for example, on carers' allowance or on uh, uh, the um, 18 to 21-year-olds housing benefit, uh, we can introduce in advance of the Scottish Government taking full control over the full delivery of all 11 benefits. And we will, um, as we are sure about what we may be able to do there, or indeed what we are not able to do, then um, this committee will be advised of that and the wider parliamentary chamber will be advised of that. And, and I say it like that not because we've made up our mind somewhere and I just don't want to tell you, right? But because it is complex. Uh, because, you know, uh, there are obviously resource issues, but in addition, there are issues around if we want to uh, bring forward the delivery of a manifesto commitment, who will deliver that would have to be the DWP in advance of our own delivery mechanism being fully tested up and running. Um, do they believe that they have the capacity, the actual capacity in their systems to do that? And what additional cost to them do they believe that would incur, which of course they would charge to us. So there are a number of uh, factors that need to be talked through and bottomed out before I can reach those kind of decisions. So that is, that is what I mean when I say it is complex and it's not something that you can easily uh, say, yes, we'll do it and we'll do it then, or no, we won't, and we won't do it till. Um, so all of that work is continuing because, um, as I'm sure you are yourself, Ms McNeil, I am very keen to introduce improvements and uh, meet our manifesto commitments as quickly as I can. But I have to balance that desire 
to make those improvements to that I believe will make a difference to individuals in Scotland with um, a careful consideration about the best use of resources and about uh, confidence or not, assurance or not, in delivery capacity at the hands of another organisation. <clears throat> Mark Griffiths and then George Adam wanted him. Mark. Thanks, Kevina. I'd just like to go back to the um, £80 million pounds budget um, for the Scotland Act implementation. On the level four figures that we've received, the budget is described as Scotland Act implementation brackets Social Security. Um, so it was my understanding that that £80 million pounds in its entirety was on um, implementation of new powers that um, fall under the remit of this committee and Social Security. But, Minister, you have said that um, that fund covers um, the entirety of the non-tax Scotland Act per. So, can I just clarify, um, just for the benefit of the committee, how much of that £80 million pounds will come under our remit and which other departments then um, have a call on that £80 million pounds if they need it? My understanding is that uh, both the Crown Estate and Employment Support uh, has a call on that £80 million. Pounds. Um, and clearly my understanding of it and the information that you have before you differs. So the best I can do, convener, if um, Mr Griffiths is content, is to undertake today to clarify that position and return to you today with uh, my specific answer. But my understanding is as I gave you it before. And obviously that is different from the information that you have. Okay, that would be helpful. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. George Adams. Thank you, convener. Minister, is it not the case that part of the complexities that you're dealing with, uh, which, as you said in your opening statement, is tackling issues while there's conflicting policies? Uh, you've got the UK government's policies and the Scottish government's policies. We, had, uh, we heard from the Sheffield uh, Hallam, and they said that Cuts uh, would the the whole of the cuts from UK Gov would actually be two billion pounds by 2020. Now, is that not part of the complexity? Is that not part of the difficulty when you're trying to deliver for uh, the people of Scotland when you've got a government who has uh, policies that are totally diametrically opposed to the ones that you're trying to implement here? Uh, well, well, yes, um, it, it is a. a a part of the complexity that um, we have two governments and they both legitimately uh, have different political perspectives on uh, what they are trying to do and they are both duly elected uh, as governments. Now, I think I referred to that um, in uh, my first appearance before this committee uh, because I think the way, the way you deal with it is... Um, to be really straightforward in recognising that there are those political differences. And um, uh, neither Damien Green or I are ever going to um, join hands and completely agree on these matters. And that's fair enough. What we have to do, though, is try and ensure that we keep political disagreements clear uh, for what they are and don't allow those political disagreements to interfere in the detailed work that our respective set of officials have to do. Now, there, there may be occasions, uh, and we, we are not there uh, at this point, uh, and, there, and it may not arise, where the UK government uh, takes a decision that we believe fundamentally uh, impacts on our ability to, do, uh, to meet our democratic mandate as a Scottish government. And at that point, we will have to have the kind of uh, political discussion that you have in those circumstances. Um, we've got a process for all of that, which is the Joint Ministerial uh, Working Group on Welfare. Uh, and indeed, there may even be an occasion where uh, that disagreement uh, cannot be resolved there. But we're not there yet, uh, and we may not be uh, at any point. And I think it is fair to say that both uh, Ms Constance and myself and our other ministerial colleagues from the Scottish Government and uh, Mr Green and his colleagues from the UK Government uh, want to do the very best that we can to not get to that point. Um, so along the way, 
we have to uh, find ways by which, whilst we might look at the same thing and see a different solution, as I said, we can nonetheless find ways to both be able to deliver uh, what we want to deliver. Uh, and uh, that is the work that uh, has begun, it has, it is going well, there's a lot of goodwill uh, behind it, um, but I think it would be unrealistic, uh, not to say naive, to think that we will never get to a point where there will be um, major political disagreements and it will be how we resolve those that will count. Thank you, um, <clears throat> thank you very much, Minister. That's uh, questions and thank you very much for your answers, per se, as well. Um, have a very Merry Christmas and enjoy your Christmas reading. <laughs> and I'm sure we'll enjoy ours also. Uh, I close the session and move into private session. Thank you.